Hello everyone. Thank you for standing by and welcome to our webinar, Pediatric Emergencies, Prevention and Management, sponsored by ISIS Parenting and presented by Jonathan Epstein. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Content and Online Learning here at ISIS Parenting. I'm also a mother baby nurse specialist and board certified lactation consultant and board certified in pediatrics. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen only mode. However, you may submit questions to us at any time by typing them through the chat feature located to the left of your screen. We've incorporated many of the already submitted questions into the presentation and will take additional questions at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording by email tomorrow along with additional resources. So if you need to miss something or step away for any reason, that's okay. ISIS Parenting is proud to host this evening's webinar. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly edited selection of products for expecting and new families in our four Boston area centers, five brand new centers in the Dallas area, and four new centers in Atlanta, Georgia. Visit our website at isisparenting.com to learn more. As I mentioned, I'm Nancy Holtzman, and I'll be your moderator this evening. It's my pleasure to welcome Jonathan Epstein. Jonathan Epstein is a Senior Director for the American Red Cross National Headquarters in Washington, D.C. He served on the leadership team of the International First Aid Science Advisory Board and was a core contributor and author of the International First Aid Guidelines. Clinically trained as a paramedic, Jonathan has decades of experience caring for patients in the greater Boston, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. areas in ambulance and emergency department settings. Jonathan is also the proud dad of two teenagers. He lives outside Boston and also has been a key ISIS parenting team member for many years. He continues to teach CPR, first aid, and safety programs for ISIS parenting in the Boston centers. Welcome, Jonathan. Great. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today um, for this really exciting um, webinar going over some really important information related to pediatric emergencies. Um, so just to give a little... Um, background, and Nancy did a terrific job of explaining my, um, my credentials, but just to give a little confidence to the audience, I always do like to say that I, you know, as a paramedic working in ambulances in the greater Boston and Philadelphia areas, I've taken care of lots of infants and children in lots of different situations in my past. So I've done the skills that we're going to talk about today. I've seen these real um, firsthand emergencies um, where I can speak to them um, from that perspective as a provider, as well as a, a researcher and an evaluator of the science related to first aid and CPR and how it applies into a real emergency. So uh, today, you know, really focus on pediatric emergencies, and it's a great time of year to talk about this as it's summertime, we're out and about moving around um, with our children um, and all kinds of summertime activities. We'll be able to touch upon many of those um, you know, areas of concern that may pop up throughout the course of the summer. Uh, but first is really what, what is an emergency? You know, you know, a medical emergency is really something that we can't potentially handle at home. Uh, may be difficult to recognize when uh, there is a, um, a situation that you need additional assistance. So really a, a medical emergency is something that you feel you can't handle on your own and you may need additional help. And now that may be through a phone call to your pediatrician. That may be utilizing the EMS system, emergency medical services, and calling 911. And we'll go through some of those issues today um, in, a, in a couple slides from now. Um, I also wanted to talk about some just general principles for all emergencies really quickly, some things that we always want to do, um, and really our large focus is prevention, prevention, and prevention. We want to make sure that we're preventing any emergencies before they happen because um, the best way to keep our children safe is to prevent them from becoming injured or ill um, in the future. Um, CPR skills, why they're important. Um, I'm asked that question often, you know, do I really need to take an infant CPR class and a toddler or child CPR class and an adult CPR class? And the answer really is yes. Um, the skills for CPR and first aid are very, very different when we focus on different age groups. Um, the physical skills of CPR for an infant, as an example, using two fingers to push hard and fast in the chest is different than a toddler where you're using the, the, the heel of one or two hands in the center of the chest. Our choking skills are also different based on age group. So I can't over um, kind of urge you to consider taking a, you know, a full CPR first aid class to really get hands-on practice. And I know I've seen some questions already come in um, for tonight's webinar to talk about how do I keep this information fresh. And it's really um, taking courses 
on a consistent basis. We know we lose the information fairly quickly. So tonight while you'll have a link to this webinar, certainly feel free to take notes and, um, and send in chat questions along the way, and we can kind of move us forward from there. So what happened and why, and is it serious? Um, as I already talked about, you know, prevention is super, super important when we deal with children. The best way to protect our kids is to prevent the emergency from happening, um, and especially because leading, um, injuries are the leading cause of death um, for children from six months, actually all the way up to adulthood to 44 years of age. So if we can prevent it from happening, we're better off. I like to focus when I talk about prevention from typical childhood emergencies, really focusing on that older infant who's now cruising, crawling and or toddlers that are learning how to walk, jump, run, and um, all at the same time is focus on our doors, our windows, and our stairs. And what do I mean by that? Um, we can spend a lot of time child-proofing an environment, focusing on every cabinet, every um, drawer, every vanity, or if we're really strong about protecting our doorways and keeping children in the rooms that we want them to be in and not in rooms that we don't, such as the bathroom, cellars, garages where they can get through that doorway. Um, if we just keep those doors closed with a, a child pr uh, protective cover on those doorknobs, often we can prevent that disaster from happening of a child getting out of the house or into an environment we don't want them to be in. Windows are similar in the such that we don't want obviously children playing near windows. Um, we always think, oh, it's a beautiful summer day. Let's open up that window, get some fresh air in the house, which is terrific. But if there's just a screen in that window and a child may be playing on the bed or a sofa um, near the window itself, there's a good chance if they fall backwards against that screen, they could go right out that window. So we want to prevent um, children from falling out windows by using window guards um, or limiting the height of the windows that can be raised. Certainly the cords from blinds and, and things such as that should be um, removed as well so that we don't have any you know, strangulation um, concerns with, with, the, with the cords. Um, but really keeping those windows down. Um, I actually in my own home, did something very simple and was less expensive than buying a really fancy contraption to keep my windows closed and locked. I actually used a little rubber stopper and a screw and went into the side of the window at about four inches up from the sash. And so as I raised the window, it only got four inches. And that way I knew the window couldn't go any higher unless it was an emergency. In an emergency, should there be a fire, which is always everyone's concern, what if I have to get out that window, which is why I'm not a proponent of key locks on windows themselves. But I could always raise that window quickly. The screw would pop right out. The, the rubber stopper would be away, and I could get through that window if I had to. Um, so certainly consider keeping the windows and keeping children just not playing near open windows, certainly, um, or even closed windows for that matter, because we have glass and other issues to be concerned with. The last um, area of prevention that I like to focus on is stairways. And you can see in the, in the slide on the screen, um, if you're looking at this little um, infant crawling up the, the stairs themselves, Stairs can be a tragic place for infants to, um, to fall. And I'll talk about childhood tra challenges here in a moment, um, but certainly their mobility and their curiosity is going to have them moving up and down um, structures, whether it be stairs or window sills or other uh, non-play areas that we want to kind of keep them out of. And using gates that affix directly to um, hallways or to banisters, not pressure sensitive gates, but ones that actually screw or drill into the wall. Um, it was a great idea to really prevent that child from going whether it be head first because they're top heavy, going down the stairs, um, et cetera. So focus on our doors, our windows, and our stairs in the house. And we'll talk about some car safety and prevention with the car seats um, a little bit further on. Um, quickly, I do want to talk about childhood challenges. And what do I mean by that? Because obviously having a child is always a challenge, um, and it's a wonderful challenge for many of us. Um, but there are certainly things that relate to the childhood development that we have to think about in an emergency. Um, in a younger toddler or even infant, it's very, very difficult to communicate with. So communication is certainly one of our major challenges. How do I know my child has a headache or doesn't feel well? Because they can't just walk over and say, I don't feel well today, mom or dad. Um, I, you know, what are we looking for with them? We're going to look for clues. What do they look like? Are they changing the way that they behave on a daily basis? You know, I expect them when they bump their, their toe against the wall, they're going to scream and cry, be upset, and if I give them a Band-Aid, they happily go on skipping down the hallway. Um, as a toddler, if that's normal behavior for them on an everyday basis, terrific. But if they act differently, then we have to assume there may be something wrong. So often when I teach a class, I talk about a child acting in a strange way. And all children act in a strange way from, you know, from one to another, but certainly um, a child acting different from the normal behavior or pattern. 
Another challenge, uh, challenge we have with childhood is certainly just their pure development, their physical development. Um, their heads are bigger than ours, proportional to body size than an adult. They tend to fall forward because they have this big heavy head with weak neck muscles. So as they get ahead of steam, they can actually fall forward, often reaching out on their arms. And we'll talk about some fractures and other first aid techniques in a, f in a few moments. Um, but certainly falling and breaking a wrist um, or getting themselves um, bumping their head on, on, a, on going down the stairs or in a hallway, very, very common. As well as just a child who wants to grow. And they're used to running underneath that 30-inch uh, tabletop in your kitchen because um, that's what they've done for the last six months without a problem. Now they've grown an inch or two in a few weeks. They forget about that, and they run right into the, uh, the tabletop not realizing that they don't have the clearance that they used to have. So just as they grow, we have challenges as well with kids. Um, one of the general principles I always like to talk about is checking the scene. Um, what does that mean? It means making sure you take a look first at what's happening and what's going on in the situation and not just rushing in um, and jumping in and grabbing your child and giving the hugs and the kisses and trying to console them. But what's actually happening? Why is that child on the floor, um, maybe not moving around? Is it because there's a noxious fume and a carbon monoxide detector is going off in the house? And should I really be here? Is it safe? Maybe I should get my child and get out of the house and then help them? Um, or is there a car coming across the street and you're running across to get them because they've skinned their knee um, you know, as they went o over the sidewalk or the curb? Um, so we want to make sure we're checking, is it safe to be here? Um, as well, it's just what do you see and what do you hear um, you know, happening? And often that sound, and we'll talk about this in just a few moments, may be what alerts you to the emergency itself. Um, and then we'll get into checking the child. Typically when we check a child for an emergency, if it's your child, you can really start right from the head and work your way right down to the toes. Um, just look up and down, you know, are there any bumps and bruises and scrapes and abrasions? Are they acting in the right way? Are they bleeding anywhere? But we don't want to just check the child where we think they're hurt. We want to check the entire child because often you may see you know, a little cut on their arm that they may be reacting to where they're bleeding or they're upset, but what we miss is that they have a big bruise on their back um, or they bump their head because children and, and even adults, we tend to react to what we see. So if we check the entire child from head to toe in the same way every time, we'll have a, a, a great opportunity not to miss any kind of a life-threatening uh, situation. So who do we call and when do we do it? So making the call for an emergency is really not as difficult as, as we think it is, but it is certainly something we want to talk about. You know, should I call the pediatrician? Do I call 911? Um, do I call a friend? There are a lot of places we're going to call for guidance and advice in an emergency. And really what I've, we've put here is some really simple basic guidelines. They don't cover every situation. Um, but they really do cover kind of the, the, the peak or the, or the vast majority of things that we would um, you know, recommend for you to do. So if you have an, what you feel is an emergency or an urgent healthcare matter, um, take these two kind of um, columns, the pediatrician versus 911, and kind of make these basic separations. So if the child's awake, they're acting normally to how you'd expect them to behave, um, if you think it's a minor illness or injury, if they're taking a prescribed medication at home, maybe a meter dose inhaler for an asthma or bronchiolitis, or it might be a nebulizer treatment for, you know, again, for that same respiratory condition, and they're responding to it, um, then we probably just need to call the pediatrician for some follow-up, but always being on the alert for if something should get worse, we can always turn around, hang up, and call 911. The 911 emergencies are really the ones that we want to focus on the most. And obviously, any time a child unresponds, even just for a few minutes, um, or even just for a few seconds for that matter, as Nancy's looking at me right now, um, you know, you question about, you know, if a child bumps their head and they're unconscious for even five, six seconds, there was enough of a blow to their head that that warrants a 911 phone call. So even if they were unconscious briefly, even wake up, we still want to involve emergency, responses, uh, emergency services in that situation. Um, Any time a child an infant is having trouble breathing, we want to focus on that. Difficulty breathing is the precursor typically to our more serious cardiac events that happen in kids. Kids, thankfully, haven't been sitting on the couch eating potato chips with the remote control for so many years, so they don't develop cardiac disease. Um, so breathing is really the problems we have with kids, whether it be a drowning or a suffocation or certainly choking that we'll cover in a little bit. Um, these are all things that can lead to a cardiac arrest in a child. So trouble breathing whether it's been a change in their skin t color and um, their, their noises that they're making when they're breathing, um, they can't cry vigorously or can't speak in one or, more than one or two word sentences as they get older and are speaking you know, as older toddlers and preschoolers, those are signs of some potential serious breathing emergencies. Um, severe bleeding, so bleeding you can't stop quickly and easily. Um, 
we want to certainly call 911. If you just see something that looks significant, you're not sure, but I think they're, they're really hurt, they're really sick, call 911. The, you know, it's a best case, worst case scenario for everyone. If they're not seriously injured and EMS has to arrive, and as a paramedic I've done this many times, I arrive on scene, the child's crying vigorously, they're breathing well, their heart's working, their brain's working. We'll check them out, and worst case scenario, they stay home with you, and I don't have to take them to the hospital, uh, but that's also the best case scenario for you. Um, when in doubt, always call EMS. And certainly the last one does not respond to the medications. If they're taking a daily medication or they're taking um, those emergency inhalers or an epinephrine auto injector and things like that, if they're not responding to their medications, certainly we want to be calling 911. And for some of these medications as prescribed by the physician and the manufacturers, even when you use the medication such as epinephrine, you're going to call 911 either way. So let's talk about some common emergencies. And we created a small selection for you today um, of maybe I think 10 or 11, maybe 12 um, different emergencies to kind of go through. It's not everything in first aid because we could be here for many, many hours and days talking about them, but we're going to give you what really the most common emergencies from a childhood, whether it be an older infant um, or a toddler, what we see happening to them um, in you know, different circumstances. And we'll start with a kind of a summertime emergency first, and then we'll work through some really common emergencies and some that aren't you wouldn't think are as common as they really are, but certainly they're critical enough that we should discuss how to treat them and, and recognize them. So the first common emergency we're going to talk about is drowning. It's summertime. Um, we're around water. Children are around, around water. There's a much greater opportunity for them um, to get into the, whether it be into the pool, um, into the river or the ponds, um, in the lake. And we have to make sure we're doing that in a really safe situation. So while we have in the very bottom of the slide that prevention tips, I mean, the really the biggest prevention tip that I like to start with is a child should never be beyond arm's reach of you when, you're, when they're in the water. So I was a lifeguard. I started my EMS career as a lifeguard, and I sat on a lot of pool decks watching parents and children. And often, you know, parents are sitting on the wall, and the child's learning how to swim with their water wings or, you know, or holding onto a noodle in the middle of the uh, shallow end. We think they're fine, but a moment later they slip off. The water wings fall off because they tried to raise their hands over their head, and they slip down into the water without anyone noticing. So keeping arms reach with a child, keeping them away from water itself, whether if you have a pool, making sure your fences and your gates are closed and locked. You can purchase alarms that um, signify if a child's leaving the house, or if something disrupts the water itself. There's different techniques and devices out there for that as well. But certainly be mindful, especially when you're in hotels, especially when you're um, you know, at, at, a, at a friend's beach house or on a boat where a child may not understand where things are and what they can get into and out to. You, know, you may child-proof and prevent a child getting to water, but Aunt Millie from Minnesota, who I'm going to pick on a couple times tonight probably, but Aunt Millie doesn't know to have to make sure, oh, I have to keep that sliding glass door closed. So make sure we're vigilant of where is my child right now. So let me go back to the top of this and really talk about what drowning really look like. Um, and there's been a, several studies um, over the years done uh, to really take a look at what is drowning. And we've had different terms of drowning and near drowning and dry drowning, and there's lots of different terms out there today, but really the, the, the term really we want to focus on is drowning. And what is and what does it look like? And really, drowning is not what you see on television. It's not what you see or hear about in the news, because um, drowning is silent. Um, most children and most adults that suffer an emergency related to drowning they never are heard from. And this is why vigilance is so important because the problem is, and think about this yourself, if you're in the water and you need to take a breath of air or you need to shout for help, which one would you choose? If you're struggling to breathe, you want to breathe, and then you get more and more tired. It's a cycle where you actually get down underneath the surface of the water and can't propel yourself above it. So often those drownings, we don't hear the, the victims screaming for help or flailing or waving their arms as you see in every you know, movie and, t and, and TV show. So we want, again, constant vigilance, constant vision on those children. And while I'm focused on the indoor summertime pool, river, so drowning can really happen everywhere and anywhere. Um, unfortunately, in my career, one of the first infants that I took care of as a paramedic was a five-month-old from a, in a bathtub drowning. Um, so I have, you know, some personal experience with this. It, it's a horrific situation, but even leaving a child alone in two or three inches of water can be tragic. Um, so again, always, always, always be with them. Um, how does drowning happen? Some common scenarios. Um, I think I kind of alluded to some already, but certainly a child being curious, that childhood challenge of just wanting to, hey, 
I'm locked behind this gate or this fence and I want to see what's on the other side, um, they may just get themselves into an area where they shouldn't be um, and get themselves into trouble because they don't quite honestly have the, the physical, musculoskeletal um, makeup to actually get themselves out of a dangerous situation in the water. There's no such thing as waterproofing or swimproofing your child where there's some programs where they'll throw these babies in the water and you'll see it on YouTube and they'll come up and be able to float on their backs and save themselves. They don't truly work. Um, there's no science behind them. Um, we really want to make sure we have good, strong water competency, that we're teaching our children how to behave in the water and enjoy the water. And I'm not saying not go near the water with them, but certainly making sure it's a safe environment and a respected environment, um, the water. Um, so what happens if a child does have a situation in the water? And you, know, they, you find them where they're two or three inches underneath the water, kind of struggling with those arms and legs to, you know, underneath. They've been there 10, 20, 30 seconds. What do you do? Obviously, if it's safe to do so, you want to get them out of the pool or out of the, out of, out of the body of water and get them up to dry, you know, to a dry land as quickly as we can so that they can actually make sure they're breathing and crying and screaming and coughing and all those things that tell us that their airway is working and they're able to breathe. Um, for some reason, if they were unresponsive, you couldn't wake them up. Um, the treatment for a drowning child or an adult is going to be to do CPR, uh, which is another reason we should take a CPR class, certainly, but it's actually not to do what a lot of people have heard, you know, roll them over and squeeze on their back or push on their belly and, and push all the water out of their, of, of their belly or do the Heimlich maneuver, because actually all those things are proven not to work. And actually doing really good CPR will clear water if there is any water in, in their lower airways and in their lungs, it will clear it out and help get oxygen back up to their brain just by doing that good CPR. I mean, if there's sand or seaweed or something for some reason got in from the beach, yes, if you see something in their, in their airway, you're going to clear that out with your fingers and try and kind of get all that stuff out. But don't waste time trying to roll them over and drain the water out of their mouth. Just doing good CPR, um, the hard and fast pushes to the chest with the appropriate breaths is going to actually help solve that problem. Um, so if we have to do a CPR, they start to wake up, they start to cry and cough, hopefully. They may spit up a little bit of water if you're successful. What do you do now? We're still certainly calling 911. Anytime a child has had a, a, an incident under the water where they become unresponsive, we're calling 911 even if they wake right up. And even if a child has a significant incident in the water where they were never unconscious, but they certainly took a lot of water in, you should have a conversation with your pediatrician. And there's this concept of dry drowning out um, in the world today that we hear a lot about. There's some questions that we received over the last um, couple days as the pre-questions uh, pre to this webinar. Um, there's a lot of fictitious information and miscommunication of what dry drowning is and isn't. And I'm certainly not an expert in dry drowning, um, but it really involves you know, the, the, this process of disruption of, of the oxygen in the body um, by spasming off the back of the throat so they can't breathe very well. So what we do know is they should be watched for a good four hours. If there's not an untoward incident after four hours of fairly vigilant watching them, they're generally going to be fine. Um, but certainly um, talk to your pediatrician if you think there's been an incident where they've brought a lot of water in, they're struggling and coughing, and they were never unconscious. But um, watch them for a good period of time. Talk to the pediatrician and decide what you'd like to do. Um, and generally, most children will actually do fine. So moving on from drowning. And I, and I do apologize for some of the topics today. I get a little blunt from time to time, and I'm really talking about some pretty scariest things, um, serious things today that are scary, and they're really scary for parents, and I understand that as a parent. Um, and I've had to deal with some of these issues with my own children. Um, but the whole point is really to give you a sense of, yes, these are things that can happen, but I want to tell you right now that the vast majority of children do absolutely fine, and typically it's the bumps, the scrapes, and the bruises that we worry about. And these big things that we're talking about, while they can happen, we want you all to recognize them if they do, they're pretty rare events from actually happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So don't stress all night long of all these things that can happen. I, I sometimes get blunt really just to give you a sense of, um, to share the importance of what, uh, what I see in some of these emergencies. So going from drowning, we're going to look at falls. And I'm going to kind of give you the after the thud three scenarios. So your child is falling, and you can come up with however you like to talk about that, whether it be an infant falling from a, maybe a, a couch or bed onto the carpeted floor, or a child who's fallen um, off a play structure in the playground, um, maybe hit their head. But I'm going to go through kind of three scenarios about you know, how to react to that. Typically, a child falls down in scenario one, and they immediately get up absolutely fine, dust themselves off, and say, hey, I want to do that again. Remember we talked about that children acting in a strange way? It may be normal for them, but 
If they get up and act normally as if nothing's wrong and they go back and on their merry way, they're probably fine. You'll watch them for a little bit certainly, maybe make sure that you know, they didn't cut something. But generally, those are the kids we don't really worry about. The next scenario is that, that child that falls down. Maybe they bump their head um, and they're all of a sudden kind of that burst into tears. They're really, really upset. And these are the children that we as parents want to go pick up. We want to pick them up and hug them and kiss them and make sure they're okay. And what I usually tell parents is to not to pick them up. Wait to see the child's reaction. If a child is already walking, they'll typically get up, and if they'll run to you, I have much less concern about their long-term um, issues with head injuries or broken bones and, and, and bumps and scrapes because they got up on their own power. They knew enough to come to you, so their brain's working, their breathing's working, and the heart's working. So that's all good stuff, and we want to just kind of watch them for a period of time, but typically they're okay. The third scenario is the one that's most concerning to me, and that's the child that falls. Um, or, or, or you know, rolls off a surface, they strike their head potentially, and they're just lethargic, they're unconscious, they don't move. We want to pick them up. It's our goal to try and pick them up and give those, those you know, again, those comfort care and, and check them out. These are the children we don't want you to pick up at all. If they can't get up on their own, they don't react immediately with that, that cry or whatever they would do in a normal way, we want to really focus on keeping their head still because we're protecting them from a head or neck or back injury, um, making sure we're calling 911, and limiting as much as possible any extra movement of that child. Um, so how do you check your child who's falling down? Again, we, I talked about that head-to-toe check, and that's literally just touching them from the head and working away all throughout their body. And we start with the big parts of the body first, the head and neck and chest and belly and pelvis. Then we do each, each leg individually. Then we do each arm individually. They see if they wiggle their toes and you know, wiggle their fingers. But certainly make sure that things are working. We're looking for those bumps and scrapes and bruises, any bleeding, things like that. Um, how do children fall? Um, they can fall any which way they want. Um, but typically speaking, we talked about that really big head. So they're top heavy. They lose their balance. They certainly lose their balance often, especially as they grow. And most children do fall forward, and mostly out on an outstretched arm. And we'll talk about fractures in a few minutes. But showing that outstretched arm. Um, typically causing, you know, whether it be a wrist injury or a wrist fracture, is very, very common because they're trying to catch themselves. If you find a child who's fallen and they're unconscious and their arms are at their side, it may have been a medical problem first versus they tried to brace their fall. And we do the same thing. If you imagine you're walking or slip on ice a little bit, you kind of put that arm out to catch yourself. We tend to land the same way. So they tend to land with the heads first often just because the head is much bigger. Um, so prevention, as you can see in the pictures here, you know, climbing up the shelves or, or trying to climb up or get to the windows, obviously we want to just keep the children out of areas they shouldn't be. Um, good vigilance, good mindful watching of them is going to help us the best way. Um, common emergency with those falls is concussion. Concussion is in the news over and over and over again on this day and age. Mostly we're seeing it based on sports injuries, um, but actually concussions happen for really young children as well. And you know, are they serious or not? Yeah, concussions can be certainly serious. We want to take them, um, um, and take them seriously. Um, traumatic brain injury is another way to say the words concussion. Um, it's a really scary term, traumatic brain injury, but it really just means some insult or, or trauma to the head that's caused some um, um, neurological Im has a neurological impact to them. So a typical bump to the head, like the child in this um, picture here, with a big kind of a goose egg, as some people like to call it, on um, their forehead looks really bad. Typically, that's bleeding just below the skin, not typically affecting the brain, and children probably do really well from here, um, but they're kind of scary. These are the simple kind of bump in the head where we might use some ice wrapped in a towel, um, you know, just to kind of reduce some swelling, and we're going to watch the child. Um, but concussions can be serious, and how do you know what, what's a concussion, what's not? And there's lots of things that we hear about, you know, can I let my child go to sleep? What if they're vomiting? Um, the really important thing to keep in mind really relates to is the child acting normally from what you'd expect? Certainly, are they having a, a change in their vision or balance? Are they have projectile vomiting? And this means they weren't sick this morning. They bumped their head and now they're still sick. This is they were absolutely fine 20 minutes ago. They bumped their head and now sometime in the next hour or two, they start you know, profusely vomiting. That might be a concern or, or, uh, of a concussion. Um, headache. Um, difficulty seeing and switching bright lights in noisy rooms, that headache con um, continuing, almost like a, a migraine that a lot of adults would complain of, very similar to a concussion. What I've seen with a lot of younger children that are able to talk is actually short-term memory loss. So they will have circumstances where they just 
ask the same question over and over again, and it's not within their nature. And you say, I just answered what happened. I just answered this. Yeah, we're on the way to the doctor. We're on the way to the doctor. And by the third or fourth time, you're saying, what's going on with their, with their child is they may have some short-term memory loss, and that's another sign of a concussion. They can take a while to, to get through them. Some children will do fine the next day. Some of it can be weeks later. Um, so if you ever have a suspicion of a concussion, so a big bang to the head, um, you know, as we say with a football player, has their bell rung, if they think they've banged their head, we want to definitely focus on how they're behaving, what they look like, and then move on and, 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 and again watch them and watch them vigorously. Can you let them go to sleep if it's bedtime or nap time? Absolutely, they're tired, but you'd want to arouse them a little bit more during the course of the evening or during nap time. Just make sure they're easily aroused. Um, but if they had their nap and now it's an hour later and they would normally up and running around and they're very lethargic, not acting themselves, that's the sleepiness that we're worried about with a child with a potential concussion. Okay, so this is actually one of my favorite topics to talk about, which is kind of cuts and it's like it's bleeding control and cuts and do I need stitches and and what do I do and and this is a picture of Ava, who's um you know it's a little girl that actually I know and it's one of our ISIS uh, um, you know, managers' uh, daughters and she's got these nice little kind of cut in the top of her head with a bunch of little stitches and that you're looking at and cer certainly she's upset and any kind of an emergency involving stitches is going to be very upsetting to a child so we have to focus on the psychological first aid of reassurance and comforting them as well because it's scary um, for them. And blood is always scary to a younger child and often to a lot of parents. So um, how do I assess bleeding and, and how do I take care of it? Really the first thing we want to think about bleeding one, is it severe or not? Any kind of severe bleeding or free-flowing free -flowing bleeding does need to be stopped. The best thing we can do is just hold direct pressure on the wound, um, preferably with a clean glove uh, a hand if you have a, a glove to put on, but certainly just some kind of a clean cloth, a gauze pad, preferably out of the first aid kit, a sterile gauze pad. We want to hold pressure directly on the wound. And for how long? Not the 20 or 30 seconds that we typically do and say, hey, yeah, nope, nope, still bleeding. We keep uncovering and covering, uncovering and covering. A good five minutes, making sure it's not soaking through a gauze pad. If it does happen to soak through one gauze pad, you don't take that one off. Just put another one right on top and apply even more pressure. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot tonight about tourniquets. Certainly we see in disaster situations use of tourniquets, but they're not really recommended for regular routine use of bleeding control. We really want to focus on direct pressure on the wound and hold it there. Um, so what about stitches? So I control the bleeding. It's stopped, but I've got to make the decision. Do I need a stitch or not? Um, there's a lot of people that have different ideas of what would need a stitch. Um, is it too wide? Is it, is it really deep? Do the ends not close together? It won't stop bleeding. I have a really simple kind of evaluation process. There's no science to this, but it seems to work really well. If you ask yourself the question, do you think it needs a stitch? It generally does. And if it doesn't actually get a stitch, because we use glue now in hospitals and, 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 and different things such as staples and other things to control bleeding, it needs professional care. It's going to need a physician, um, a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, someone to actually kind of take and look at that wound and clean it out and make a decision how best to close it. There are a couple things we have to um, focus on with um, stitches though that we only have a certain amount of time, about six hours um, in order to get stitches put in. So we, this is something we wouldn't want to wait for overnight. Um, if it happens, we want to get to the appropriate emergency department. And I always recommend an emergency department that cares for children because um, they're better able to handle this, you know, sedating your child or even distracting your child with entertainment um, while they go through the process of getting stitches. Years ago, I remember working in an emergency department, um, and we used to tie children down, literally Velcro them down to a board, and it was really a torturous environment. Um, but now where we have the ability to um, sedate our children, um, going to a pediatric emergency department um, that can handle that is much, much better and would be great. Um, other bleeding issues, certainly things like nosebleeds. Um, a lot of rumors out there, what do I do? Do I tip, no, tilt my head forward, tilt my head back, put ice on it, pinch the lip, put an ice cube in the mouth? What do I do in nosebleeds? The myth and the fact. Certainly the fact is we want to have the child leaning forward because um, if you tilt the head back, blood can tri trickle down the back of the throat and cause vomiting. And we want to actually squeeze both sides of the nose, both nostrils together, in a big meaty part, not by the bridge, by the eyes, but down by the bottom part of the nose and squeeze those two sides together. Now again, we are talking about young children today. So we'd like to know why is the nose bleeding is probably a, a really good thing to, to look into. 
know, is there a crayon stuck up their nose um, before we start squeezing it? Make sure there's no foreign body or object up there where you might need the assistance of a pediatrician to get that out. I never recommend you per going in with tweezers or any object and trying to fish out a pea or a marble or any kind of a bead or something. Let the doctor do that for the ears or the nose. But just squeeze that nose, those two sides together if there's nothing blocking it, and just hold it for a good 5 or 10 minutes. If after 10 minutes it's still bleeding, you might want to consider the ride to the pediatrician's office um, to consider alternate um, bleeding control for that. So other things with, uh, with bleeding control certainly involves what do I do after they're done bleeding? I've stopped the bleeding. They had a little abrasion. They skinned their knee. The things that we're not going to call 911 for, we won't call the pediatrician for. But how do I care for that? Certainly clean the wound. And please, do not use alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, or any of these other kind of common um, drugstore um, shelf products. One, because many of them don't work, and many of them com cause further harm or certainly pain, which is further harm for our children. The absolute best thing to do with cleaning a wound is warm, soapy water. The running water, the friction of the running water alone will generally get most of the dirt and debris out of a wound. The soap is going to help, um, help you with that process if you have it, so that's terrific. So we certainly want to have that um, warm, soapy water that may start bleeding again. So at that point, you have a first aid kit, get out a sterile gauze pad, stop any bleeding with a little bit of pressure again, and then we want to cover the wound. We want to cover the wound with an antibiotic ointment. I make sure there's no allergy related, but some kind of antibiotic ointment, and then a Band-Aid or ultimately an inclusive dressing, so a dressing that covers all four sides of the wound and makes it, make it airtight and watertight. And then please, you don't want to do it for this, for this you know, that I'm going to bust right now. What my mother did to me growing up is, oh, it's bath time. The Band-Aid came off. We clean out the wound. And then she said, let's let it breathe for the night. Because actually letting that wound air dry all night long creates scabs, increases infection, and increases scarring. So we actually want to keep the wound covered and clean, moist, with an antibiotic ointment throughout the course of healing. It will heal much faster, and the child will do much better in the end. Um, in those situations. Jonathan, a related question before we move away from cuts. One mom wants to know about splinters. Is it better to leave them or to pull them out? That's a terrific question about splinters. And you know, typically we always say an impaled object from an EMS perspective, something stuck in the body that doesn't belong to them, we actually never remove it unless it's a healthcare professional in an emergency setting. Now, a splinter is an impaled object, but clearly we've all suffered splinters, and it's a big childhood issue where they're crawling around on wood decks and other places, and they get a splinter. So what do you do with them? Typically, we do want to remove them if we can. Um, but as I like to say when I teach my classes, we do not want to practice surgery without a license. So we don't want to start taking needles and scissors and tweezers and start opening up their skin and ripping out and pulling things out, because we're just going to introduce infection into the actual wound. So if you can feel the splint, if you can see it out of the skin, or you can feel it with your fingers, you gently rub over the area, you can feel it's above the skin using a very fine point tweezer to grab the end of the splinter itself and slowly draw it out if it's not creating more pain for the child is the best thing to do. If that's not working for you, warm soapy water, mostly at bath time, kind of work them out even with your fingers a little bit, um, but get the skin nice and soft. You might be able to use a tweezer and get it out now. Um, but I know the, the light the, the needle on fire and then start sticking into the hole, which my parents did to me growing up, is really not a good idea. But taking splinters out um, is a good idea because they can lead to infection. Same rule applies for all the wound management. You know, clean the wound, antibiotic ointment, keep it covered and watch it. Certainly look for signs of infection, redness, heat, so it's getting warm, any streaks and things going down from the wound itself would be a very serious blood infection at that point. Um, so we want to be watching for those kinds of signs of infection. But we do want to remove splinters. If it's big that you don't think you can do it safely, obviously pediatrician um, is probably a great place to go. Um, and it's really, really small, completely under the skin, or you can't feel it over your finger um, rubbing over the top of it, I would just let it be and kind of work at it bath time. And, and, and if you don't get out that night, work at it bath time again the next night. If it's not bothering the child, it's probably not going to be an issue. So thanks for that question, Nancy, and, and, and for our, the audience for sending that one in. And I want to kind of move on to um, broken bones. Um, now broken bones, while we call it a common emergency, children don't break bones all that often in relationship to adults um, because their bones aren't as um, brittle 
um, or kind of solid yet um, from a young age that ours might be. So it takes a lot of force to, to actually break a, break a bone. But there are some very common kinds of breaks and fractures for kids that we want to talk about. And I alluded to it before, which is falling on that outstretched arm and what we call the green stick fracture. Um, but you have this kind of new, you know, their wrists are small and pliable. And it's almost if you took a stick in the woods or on a little hike and you kind of broke off a stick and kind of that green kind of pliable um, you know, material inside, well, their bones come the same thing, not fully formed yet. Um, so these are very, very common um, wrist fractures. And I'll tell you a little story about them because um, we often miss these kinds of fractures. Um, so this is probably the most common type of injury, but certainly something that um, we miss. My neighbor's daughter had taken a fall um, when she was about three years old. Um, didn't think much of it. She, you know, they said, okay, she fell. They took care of her. And then about three days later, he called me. And he said, Jonathan, you know, you're in medicine. You know, you know about this kind of stuff. And I said, yeah, well, how can I help you? And he said, my daughter fell a couple days ago, um, but, she, you know, but she's fine. But all of a sudden, we're noticing she's not eating or coloring or doing anything with her right arm. I said, well, did she fall on her right arm? Well, I'm not sure. I think so. I'm like, oh, she broke her wrist. And he said, of course. What do you mean? What do you mean she broke her wrist? I said, she broke her wrist. I, I got a nice dinner out of it. She, he went to get the x-ray. She had a broken wrist with one of these green stick fractures. Um, she ended up in a cast for three, three weeks. Did absolutely fine. But children often um, don't complain of pain with these fractures, so they can be, hard to, they can be easy to miss. So we want to, again, this history of fall, we're watching them. They just, she just changed her behavior. She said, hey, I get two wrists. I don't have to call her with my right. I can just use my left. So just that subtle change, we took three days for, her to, for um, the parents to figure out, is actually not atypical. It's very, very typical. Even doctors and nurses miss this all the time in their own children. Um, so again, history of fall, we want to watch out what's going on. Um, how do we assess a child? What do we do for a broken bone? Um, I may be a paramedic and I've written first aid guidelines, but I don't have x-ray eyes uh, and you don't have x-ray eyes. If you think there's a fracture or a dislocation, and a fracture is just a bone breaking, a dislocation is the joint between the bones that's disrupted, we need to get an x-ray. So if you think there's a problem, we certainly want to get an x-ray. How do you do that? Probably an emergency department, although I would consult with the pediatrician because many will send you, you know what, let's skip the emergency department, let's go right to the orthopedic. Um, pediatric orthopedics office where they can do an x-ray there because they're going to do a follow-up x-ray there anyway. But if you think it's an emergency, we always call, you know, we'll, we'll, and we'll talk to you momentarily about when to call 911 versus not. But certainly getting an x-ray is super, super important. Um, so what's an emergency fracture or potential fracture and what's not? When do I call 911 versus when do I take care of this myself and maybe drive my child to the, um, um, to, to the emergency department or the pediatrician's office? If it's an area from the kind of wrist or lower arm down to the fingertips, or it's from their ankle down to their toes, those kinds of fractures are something that you can generally, or suspected fractures or dislocations, you can generally, unless the child's in excruciating pain, is actually put them appropriately in their car seat, you know, strapped in impregnably, not, not adjusting any of their buckles. We want to make sure that they're safe in the car, and can probably transport them just using a pillow or a towel to wrap their foot or arm in. Um, for that ride, but anything that's the kind of upper leg, any of the kind of upper leg, the um, kind of well, the lower leg or the upper leg, the upper arm, elbows, shoulders, obviously the head, neck, and back, suspecting a fracture, those are all emergency calls, and not so much that you know it's lights and siren emergency, but so that the paramedics can come and immobilize and transport that injured child in the right way. The paramedics often can give medications to kind of soothe the child, so every time they hit a bump, they're not going to feel that fracture as well. They can use a medication that can actually help the child forget the incident ever happened to begin with. So pain control is another reason we actually use EMS. Often we, we, we wouldn't think that would be a purpose, but it actually can be a very um, appropriate pur purpose for EMS. Um, and what about the child that maybe just, you know, maybe it's a sprained ankle, um, it's a minor muscle injury, or you know, they get a bruise or something. So what do we do with those? I always tell people, remember the sports medicine and acronym RICE. And I know it's in the bottom of the screen, and we changed it. So I'm not sure how many of you can pick out where we changed it over the last couple of years, but the I and C, the I and the C in rice, the acronym changed. So rest is still rest. Good luck with a two-year-old telling them to rest and not go out and play with the rest of their friends. Um, they can't go down the slide right now because they're resting that wrist. So that's a challenge as a parent to have a child, you know, to a child not to use that um, body part. But certainly we want to rest it. Don't overuse something that's injured. 
The next is the eye is immobilized, which means really just an ACE wrap, maybe a loose splint until it gets further care from a, a physician or an x-ray. Um, we're not going to have you put a formal big splint on. It's really just an ACE bandage or an ACE wrap up around um, the area with a little compression. But please do not cut off the circulation. You know, you want, if you put anything on, make sure they have good blood flow below. It's not getting tingly. It's not you know, causing pain or numbness or burning. Um, it's just to kind of remind the child not to use that part of the body right now. Um, cold is what you know, used to be compression. We switched that I was ice, C was you know, now it's immobilized, C was cold, what used to be compression. So cold means not ice. It means taking some crushed ice in water in a mixture in a plastic bag and then cover that with a towel and then put that over the injured area for 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, um, and you can do just fine with that. Um, you don't have to do it all night long, changing it out, usually 20 minutes on, 20 minutes off, maybe 20 minutes on again, and see how the child's doing, and maybe repeat it in the morning when they wake up um, if necessary. That's just to help reduce some swelling. Um, a bag of frozen peas actually works really well too um, if you don't want to go to the process of making crushed ice and, um, and water mixtures. The chemical ice packs don't do a very good job. One, they don't get cold enough. They don't stay cold long enough. And there are chemicals in there that should they leak or break open, um, especially with younger children, we worry about it getting into their eyes and into their mouth because it gets on their hands and things like that. And the last one is elevate, getting that body part up above the level of the heart if it doesn't hurt to do so. If it causes pain to raise that arm or leg up, um, there may be something else going on and we're not going to worry about it as much. Um, but if we can elevate without pain, um, we certainly want to do that. Now, I'm going to talk about a couple of quick blunt things. You know, if there's a bone sticking out of the skin for some reason, you're calling 911. I think it's pretty obvious, but we never try and push the bone back in. And if there's a lot of deformity or the bone is angulated in a way that we don't want it to, you know, it just doesn't look normal, don't try and bend it and straighten it back out. Leave it as you find it. Call EMS, and we'll take care of those situations for you. That's a quick 911 phone call. Again, these are rare events, but they certainly can happen. So I'm going to move away from um, injuries for a little bit here. I'm going to talk about some more common um, medical emergencies, and one that is really in the news all the time, and it's changed our daily lives from packing lunches to daycare or to school environments is this issue of allergies and allergic reactions. There are a lot of things um, that people can be allergic to, and you know, some of us can have peanuts and strawberries and, and milk and chocolate and soy and eggs and, and play with bees and all those other fun things, um, but some of us can't. And it's really important to understand what's a severe allergic reaction and what's not a severe allergic reaction. So I'm just going to go through a couple basic um, symptoms for you and to give you a sense of what you might need an epinephrine auto-injector for um, if there's a pre-diagnosis versus when you should call 911 versus when you can handle it at home. And most people think, you know, the typical, I'm itchy, I'm sneezing, watery eyes, we all know that's a mild reaction. Makes sense. Once they put a rash on top of that, so maybe they're having a more severe reaction, I have to think about epinephrine and 911, and actually probably you don't. A rash and actually hives as well, and a big red raised bumps are not considered a severe reaction. It's issues of difficulty breathing and swelling of the face and lips and tongue and back of the throat and signs of shock, which is pale and cool and sweaty. And if it's a food allergy, they may have nausea and vomiting with that. Those are our severe signs and symptoms of allergic reaction. Those are the ones we really worry about. So if your child has no history of an allergy at this point, um, they start showing you know, a rash or something, certainly we're calling the pediatrician, writing down what did they just eat, what were they exposed to. If they ever get to the point of having trouble breathing, we can skip the pediatrician right now and call 911. Um, but once there's a history of allergic reaction and they do have an auto-injector um, prescribed to them, we want to learn how to use it and practice it often. Most prescriptions now come with a training device. So every few weeks, if not a few months, you want to practice using it, whether it be on an orange, whether it be on your own leg, because they don't have a real needle in them. But being familiar with how to use an auto-injector is super, super, super important. Um, so moving on, oh, and showing how to assess a child, what to do, and prevent the emergencies. It's really keeping those, those food products well-labeled, understanding when you're at the, the bake sale, what are you buying, what's your child getting into, and really even educating even the toddlers and preschoolers at a young age what they should and shouldn't be eating. Um, start that early about you know, uh, ingredients. And if you know they have a sensitivity or an allergy to a certain object, keep it out of their env environment as best you can. Um, but certainly, you don't want to ruin everyone else's fun, so, but you certainly set the right controls. And certainly, we can set safe limits. And schools are doing a great job with that now. Um, burns, um, there's a lot of things we could talk about burns, um, but we're really going to focus on really preventing them uh, to begin with. Most burns, the child will only do it once because they figure out after being curious, well, what's that thing on the stove and that bright red light or that, or that flame if it's open? 
ooh, what's that feel like and look like? So if they get to it, it's going to hurt. Generally, it's going to instantly um, feel that pain. Like one, they're going to remember, I shouldn't do this again. But at the same time, because they have pretty quick reflexes um, versus someone who may be actually a little older than us, typically, where our reflexes may not be as, as quick, um, they actually pull back and typically only have you know, mild to uh, moderate um, burns. They usually don't get severe burns in these situations. Uh, but what do you do with a burn? There are all types of thermal burns. There's radiation burns, sun burn, um, chemical burns, um, electrical burns. But typically it's the thermal ones, the ones involving heat or flame that we worry about the most and see the most. What do we do for them? Cool them with cool running water really until you get to the point of there's no more pain or it's been 5 or 10 minutes and there's no blistering. So a good 5 or 10 minutes and just cold tap water. And I'm going to repeat that, cold tap water, only cold tap water, because what we see at that last bullet is what not to do for a burn. We don't want to use butter. We don't want to use cream. And to be honest, we don't want to use the first aid burn cream that comes in many first aid kits. It's required in every first aid kit for a workplace to have a burn cream in it because the manufacturers or the people that make the burn ointments and burn creams sit on the board that make the decisions of what go in the first aid kit. And there's scientific evidence to prove that they actually don't work very well, and they actually can make things worse because they can insulate and trap heat. There are some ointments and creams from a prescription perspective, perspective that a physician can prescribe after initial treatment of burns that make sense. Um, and again, burns that are just red, cool running water, relieve the pain. If there's blisters and they're closed blisters, don't open them. Let them stay closed. Seek medical care if they're open. Um, or there's charred or white waxy kind of skin underneath of it, really a more severe burn, what we call it a full thickness burn. You should really be thinking about 911 in these circumstances. Um, choking, very common childhood emergency. is probably the one that most parents worry about the most, especially when we try new foods and, 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 and the such um, with the younger children. What does it look like? Um, typically, again, typically a child may reach up and grab their throat with two hands, that universal sign for choking, um, but it's actually not the natural thing to do. And we certainly didn't teach that in utero, um, that they should grab their throat. But they're going to get very, very upset very quickly without being able to make any sound. So a young toddler or even infant might just have a high-pitched squeaking or whistling kind of a noise when they breathe, but nothing beyond that. But they're really not moving any air. They're going to turn initially actually bright red. Everyone thinks it's going to turn blue, but actually bright red as they get upset. And as they use up that oxygen, they'll start getting a little paler, maybe a little more purplish and bluish as, as they go. Um, so how do we take care of a child who's choking? Certainly, we want to take a, a formal CPR class or first aid class because that's where you'll learn the actual physical skills to practice. But for infants, we use a series of back blows and chest thrusts. And for younger children, all the way up to adults, we use a series of back blows and abdominal thrusts, what we used to call the Heimlich maneuver, um, in sequence in order to best care for a choking emergency should they happen and they be awake. Um, so vigilant about watching them. Um, take that course so that you actually can practice the skills, certainly, um, and then work in succession of those skills of blows to the uh, center of the back between the shoulder blades with the heel of your hand from a few inches away. Or if we're going for a child, thumb just above the belly button, um, inward upper thrust underneath the rib cage, not over the ribs. You probably have to kneel on the floor behind them to do this. Um, that's what we would do for a child. Um, what are those common foods and non-food kind of choking hazards? I like to say round peg, round hole. Things like hot dogs and grapes and baby carrots, things that are round tend to are bigger culprits than things that aren't round just because that's what fits into the airway of the child. Um, popcorn, um, latex balloons, um, even talcum powder for some reason have been known to cause some choking episodes. So we want to be very kind of cognizant of what are our children playing with, um, putting in their mouths. And it's really hard with those toddlers and older infants because they put lots of things in their mouths because that's how they learn. Um, we want to keep those things kind of away. So we want to prep those foods, cut them into small pieces. And there's certainly something you can do at home, you know, saying, you know, should my child be playing with this toy or not? When you're talking about toys, if you just take a simple, um, either you can buy a choke tube, a plastic device that you can put things through, or take the toilet paper roll at home. And if a toy fits through the toilet paper hole, roll, um, it's too small for them to play with. And the opposite would be with food. If, if the food doesn't fit through that, and you, know, if it, you, know, you want food really, really, really small. So a, a, a quiz that I'll answer the question for you, how many pieces do you cut a grape into at a minimum for that you know, one-year-old that's learning how to eat solid foods? A grape minimum is four pieces. You're going to cut it in half and cut it in half again, get that round shape out of it. Um, febrile seizures, super, super scary stuff. Um, seizures with children, um, they're, they're not 
uncommon. They do happen. Um, but actually, while they look really scary, they're not super dangerous in the end if it's caused by a high fever. And a febrile seizure is actually caused from a fever that spikes very, very quickly. So it's a rapid rise in body temperature where a child will probably arch their back. Um, they'll be unresponsive for a period of time and may shake their arms and legs um, for, for a period of time, for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, but you do want to time it if you can. Some can last for several minutes. Um, you're going to watch them. And really what we want you to do is protect the child who might be having a seizure. Move things away from them. If they're in their car seat, they're in a stroller, they're in a high chair, they're in a crib, certainly um, they're safe in those environments. So like leaving those environments, just loosen some straps so we're not holding them down. Because if you hold a child down and having a seizure, the muscles are still going to contract and you can cause fractures and dislocations by holding down their arms and legs. So let them have that seizure. Let them work through it. When it's over, we'll roll them on their side and watch them and maintain their airway, make sure that they're breathing. One big thing is we never, ever, ever put anything in their mouths. You know, you can't swallow your tongue. It's impossible, but that's one of the wise tales that's out there. Um, and, and so a lot of people put wallets in people's mouths, or they put a spoon or their fingers because they're going to swallow their tongue, or the way they, they might bite their tongue. Well, if they're going to bite their tongue, they're going to bite your fingers as well. Um, so we don't want your fingers in there. Certainly if they bite their tongue, it will heal um, without much of a problem. So let the seizure run its course. Watch the child, certainly, um, as you go. They're, and again, they are scary, and I understand that. Um, if there is the first time seizure, you always call 911. A history of seizures, sometimes you don't need to call 911 once you've worked this out with a pediatrician and the neurologist, and they'll get you on a regimen of appropriate medication. Um, children who have history of febrile seizures, often maybe when they start getting the sniffles, they start getting low-grade fever, we might start a little earlier. Some Tylenol, Motrin, as prescribed by the physician, but certainly talk to the pediatrician about that, what they want to do for your child in that circumstance. Um, and again, you can certainly roll them on their side um, after the seizure is over um, to kind of let them until they wake up because that's kind of a, um, a situation, um, you know, while they're post, it's called post ictal, but they might be unresponsive for a period of time. They're going to wake up very slowly, lethargic, have a headache. So we just kind of roll on the side, loosen the restrictive clothing, and a cool compress to their neck and armpits and legs. Um, it doesn't hurt, but don't put them in an ice bath just because they had a high fever. Uh, motor vehicle crashes, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, it's all about prevention. Um, drive safely, wear your seat belts, and make sure children are in their safety seats as appropriate for their age. Um, rear facing seats, hopefully everyone knows it's still their two years of age now. Um, rear facing, but make sure it's the right seat that's made to go um, to the appropriate weight when they are rear facing. And you want to make sure it's the right seat, the right installation, and you use it every single time, every situation, even when they're injured or sick and you go in the pediatrician's office, the emergency department, they need to be in their seat correctly to protect them and protect you. Um, the safest place for them to be is in their seat during a time of a crash. Um, so certainly pay attention to that. And have professional installation, if you can, from a local police or fire department, from a certified um, seat technician. Um, don't just take someone's word for it, ask them if they've been to the certifying class. And then, but what do you do after the crash? Uh, if a seat's been involved in the crash, it is recommended that we remove the seat from the service. So that means if the seat's involved in a significant crash, it's really easy to get the seat. Um, it's really a one crash. Um, seats are really meant for one crash themselves. And there's lots of information on different websites out there, um, sort of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and I think also Safe Seat um, uh, websites as well. And we can get some more information about the local laws um, in your state, in your area, of what's required for it by ages, et cetera. I know we're just finishing up here, um, so a quick in summary. I'm sure Nancy will have a question or two to pop in. Um, but my key is you know, you want to learn first aid and CPR, focus on prevention by doing the child uh, proofing as appropriate. And then when you learn those skills, and even like uh, as a course tonight, we want you to certainly to um, refresh the information. You know, go through it again. Every three to six months, you really do need to look at this information to maintain um, your ability to retain the information for longer periods of time. Um, so if you have questions, I know people have been typing them in. Hopefully I've answered many of them. Um, and there may be opportunities down the line as well for me to see you in a class someday. Um, and, and good luck. And hopefully none of these emergencies happen. But you know, they do, and most we can handle at home, never have to call EMS. And children do just fine, and they grow up to normal, be normal, well-adjusted adults. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. It is a lot of scary information, but critical information. And I always like to tell parents, um, this way, when an incident happens on the playground to somebody else's child, you can be the person that's there assisting calm and knowing what to do. So maybe you'll be the person that can help uh, a choking toddler in the restaurant. Not your child, but somebody else's child. 
um, oh, a good comment from one of our uh, viewers who reminds us to cut the straps of the child safety seat when you're discarding it uh, for trash so that nobody else picks it up and uses it, and that's an excellent point. We are out of time, so I did want to thank you again for sharing information with us, and thank you to all the viewers who participated this evening. Remember to check your email for the presentation recording, which I will send out tomorrow along with additional links and resources. Thanks very much for being part of our audience tonight, and we hope to see you at another ISIS online event soon.